Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear Rebecca Merkel's talk from the 2017 Grace Agenda titled Reformation Salonier. To hear more of the talks from that year's Grace Agenda, find them on the Canon Press YouTube page. So, Other possible talk titles, I think, for this could have been the weaponization of hospitality or strategic hospitality or the power of the hostess. Um, The more I started digging into this, actually, the bigger it got and the more I started realizing, oh my word, this is huge. This is so much bigger than I thought it was initially. And it was a super interesting topic. And so the more I started digging, the more things I was chasing down and pretty soon I was like wait I'm never gonna have my head around the whole situation so I just have to stop but I'm just tracing one sort of one little thread and so I'm not pretending this is the complete picture of what was going on um, at the time of the Reformation this is just one little slice and the more I sort of followed that little thread the more other ones were revealed and there's just so much historical study you could do on what the women were doing during the Reformation. And it's fascinating, really fascinating stuff. Um, So what I kind of wanted to do was just talk a little bit about the historical side and then hopefully um, get some application out of it for us, even though we're in a very different uh, situation. The more I was reading about it, I just found it oddly encouraging and practical, weirdly, in ways I wasn't really expecting as as I read about some of these women. Um, so, first, what is a salonier? Uh, just the definition, what is that? Um, it's a woman who uh, runs a salon, basically. Not a hair salon, but an intellectual salon. So the word itself, I think, just refers to like part of the house. Like the salon is the front part of the house where you would receive guests. It's basically like holding court, um, where the word comes from the court itself. Uh, but it's holding court in a smaller setting, in a house. And granted, they tended to be grand houses, but it wasn't like, you know, Windsor Palace. They were smaller. And um, the salon was, it, the name comes from the room, or the front part of the house, but it was, it was a sort of a regular event that these women would host. And it was a very exclusive um, group of people that they would invite to discuss particular things. So um, the woman who runs the salon, basically through the office of hostess, uh, these women operate as agents and as funding agencies uh, for the most important writers, philosophers, and artists of the time. So they were very powerful women, but they were powerful because they were hostesses and because they threw these um, really great parties. it was a regular party with, with an exclusive guest list. It wasn't like the county fair where anybody can roll up. It was, it was an invitation-only party. And um, it was specifically for intellectual discussion and stimulation. So it was not a party just for the sake of having a party. There was a lot of that going on already. You know, people who just do things just because. Um, that was already going on. So these were women who who took the idea of like a party and then they made it into something else, into a serious uh, place of discussion. And because they would invite specific people to this, they had a really interesting mix of people. Now the women who had access to the best artists and the best poets and the best philosophers, obviously they are women who run in certain circles, which we don't all. Um, <laughs> but they, they were the kinds of hostesses where those people wanted to come. And then it was a really um, unusual cross-section that they sort of put together. And there was a lot of cross-pollination and sometimes cross-contamination that happened. And artistic movements would come out of these places or literary movements or, you know, whatever. Um, Actually, if you look up the word salonier, um, the classic definition refers to women in France in the 17th and 18th centuries. So, of course, that's later than the Reformation. Um, So we're talking, you know, one or two centuries off. But it's kind of like if you referred to the jazz age, you're gonna get a very specific thing in mind. You're talking about, you know, the 1920s up till the depression, 
that was the jazz age. But of course, jazz is quite a bit bigger than that before, after, surrounding. Um, and so this concept is one that, if you look it up, it refers to particular women in the 17th and 18th centuries in France. But those aren't really the ones I wanted to talk about. Um, those are interesting women. Um, very troubled women, most of them. Um, they were not doing positive things. It was powerful, but it wasn't necessarily necessarily positive. Um, and they actually, many people argue that the French Revolution, you can trace it back to these salons in the previous century where these art, um, the poets, the artists, the philosophers, they were talking about the issues and a lot of the sort of um, impetus for the coming revolution was born there. There's other salons that, oh, I can't even remember which war. It was like one I'd never heard of, like the Swedish-Russian war or something. Um, straight up came out of one of these women's salons because she was very uh, pro-war and she uh, made it happen, basically. But um, the way it would work is in the French setting, it would be basically like once a week, you know, Wednesdays from 5 to 9, these people have a regular invitation and they can come. And there's, it's just like um, shuffling the deck a little bit, getting some of the most powerful, influential people to come and talk and discuss. So they were there for the discussion, and the woman herself um, sort of ran it because she had something in mind, and she was very educated, and she kept the conversation going, and you know they would have scientists come and talk about what they were doing and, and so forth. And it was not a party for the sake of a party. But at the same time, if the women hadn't been good at throwing the party, nobody would have come, <laughs> right? It was a great party, um, but they were there for the conversation, they were there for the company, um, and it was a very exclusive kind of um, event. And then, of course, if there were visiting people from other countries, they would get them to come and talk and discuss. So, like, the blue, uh, the blue stockings came out of something similar to this. So it was a, it was a widespread deal, 17th and 18th centuries later than the Reformation. However, the first woman to do this in France was from Italy. She was an Italian woman from Rome, I believe, and she came to France and set up the first salon, which then sort of took off and it became, it became this, this thing. Um, it was a similar situation to the coffee house movement in England, if you know anything about that. The first coffee houses when they arrived in England and it was this new drink, it was this weird moment where uh, the first coffee house opened in Oxford, and you had all these guys coming down to, to drink coffee, but it just put them all in a new context. And so, of course, in Oxford you have, you know, the philosophers and the scientists and the astronomers and the theologians and everything, and, and they kind of are talking to other theologians, and then the scientists are talking to the scientists. Suddenly you throw them all into the coffee house, and they're talking to each other, and all this interesting stuff comes, comes out of it. It's, it's really it's just like shuffling the deck. So then in London, there were things that grew out of the coffee houses that we still have today. So Wall Street came from the coffee house because uh, these people who wanted to trade, but they weren't allowed in the Royal Exchange because they were kind of not quite it, they started doing it at the coffee house, and so Wall Street basically was born from there. The modern um, media was born from the coffee houses because you would go to the coffee house to get news. So they would go, like one of the coffee houses would be more political, that's where all the political news, you could find out the scuttlebutt there. Or you would go to a different one to hear all the gossip, the social gossip. So what they ended up doing was just printing up the news from the day and tacking it up on the wall so you could just go and read what was going on and then they started just putting it all together. So you have the, the business page and the gossip page and you know, so basically the modern media came from this coffee house movement, but again it was just this funny um, cross pollination that happened. You put these people together and something new shakes out of it. So the salons in France were comparable to the coffee houses in England. But the more I started looking at this, the more I realized the concept is far, far bigger than just the women in France who were doing that particular thing. This goes all the way back. If you think about like the women of the early church who were um, putting up the missionaries and getting people together to come listen to um, you know, the apostles preach or whatever, hosting the churches in their houses, all this kind of thing, it's, it's the same exact concept. It's a woman who can handle the crowd and who can bring in the most interesting, the newest, you know, speaker, whatever, and, and throws them together, and then something amazing is born out of it. So.
Um, that's why the talk title is The Salonnières of the Reformation. Um, so the first woman to do it in France was from Italy, and this, this had been going on sort of officially in Italy in the two centuries prior. So really at the height of the Renaissance and the Reformation in Northern Italy. And um, so that's kind of where I focused was in Northern Italy. And everybody knows about the Reformation in Germany and England. And nobody I, really knows about it going on in Italy, because probably because it didn't really take, you know, in Italy and Spain. It just didn't go, um, Spain much less. It didn't go at all in Spain. Um, Italy, there actually was a movement in northern Italy right at the beginning before the Inquisition came to Italy. And so there was some really interesting stuff going on there. And I just kind of wanted to talk about uh, one particular woman, really, um, and my husband is going to tell more of the story of what's going on 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 the side of like the theologians and the pastors and that kind of thing. He's going to be giving a talk tonight, so go hear that side from him. <laughs> he knows more about that part. Um, so basically, I wanted to start by um, looking at sort of the political situation in Italy, which is impossible to get your head around. Really, it's just the weirdest thing. So at the time of the Reformation, so late 15th century and then 16th. So right in there, the, the southern bit of Italy is held by the Spanish, so the Spanish Habsburgs from like Rome down. So they're holding that and Spain has territory all over everywhere and you know in the Netherlands and all over the place. And so the southern Italy is held by the Spanish. But then from Rome north, it was just a lot of city-states. So it really wasn't a collected unified country, really. It was city-states that were constantly having big wars with each other. So, you know, Venice was like its own entity, and Naples was its own entity, and Mantua is its own entity. So each one of these cities has its own royalty sort of associated with it, and essentially the king and queen of this little tin pot kingdom. Um, they didn't call them kings and queens, though, because anyway, they'd be like the duke or the whatever. So, um, so you have the royalty that owns the, the land and the city and has all the power in that region. But because you had so many of them in northern Italy, the sort of the royalty uh, does what royalty always does, which is intermarry with other royalty, right? So, so you're making alliances and you're trying to get allies and you know, and you do this by means of intermarriage with other, you know, other cities, and then you're trying to consolidate your power and, and all this kind of thing. Then throw the church into the mix. So you have the pope and the bishops and the cardinals, and there's a huge amount of power, wealth, and land that goes with that as well. So you have maybe Venice is a political entity, but you also have, like, the abbey there is not under the authority of the you know, the city, it's under the authority of the pope or the bishop or the cardinal or whatever. And then they have the wealth and they have uh, the taxes and they are the boss of that little thing. So picture the royalty in Italy trying to like intermarry with the other ones. And it's a big power grab all the time, right? So what happens is you end up with the political situation and then the church situation. And then over the top of this, a sort of web of family power. So families end up trying to consolidate their own interests because they have family all through everything. And you can do it by marrying your daughter off to this guy and then grabbing part of that kingdom. Or you can do it by getting your son made a bishop or made a cardinal or somehow getting placement in the church, which adds to your power and adds to your influence. So the most famous you know, families that we everybody's heard of are the Medicis, right? We all know about the Medicis, but that's a classic example. You have the Medici family who owns, owns, rules different territories in Italy, but also has popes associated with them. And so you've got the Medicis and the Borgias and, you know, various other families that were very powerful, and they're trying to consolidate their own family interests. But it also meant that anytime there's a war, and there appear to be always wars in Italy at this time, you're related to everybody on both sides, right? So you've got family everywhere. So it's just a big hot mess. Then throw the Holy Roman Emperor Empire onto the top, and I don't think anyone understands what that was. So you have the emperor who's, I don't know, drifting around like in Austria or something. I don't even know what his thing, anyway. So a complicated situation, and the politics were ridiculous. Um, so you've got, 
uh, very, very wealthy families. Then you have incredibly wealthy cities, and this is really the height of the Reformation, or not the Reformation, the Renaissance, the height of the Renaissance. So you've got this explosion of learning and art and architecture, and it was an amazing nation. I mean, it was powerful, it was wealthy, it was innovative, and it was just an incredible century for Italy. So I wanted to talk first about um, a pope, Alexander VI, who uh, became pope in 1492. So as Columbus was sailing the ocean blue, he became the pope. And um, Pope Alexander VI is a classic case of why the Reformation needed to happen. And as Rachel pointed out earlier, now it, it seems like it's kind of hip to sort of throw on a little bit of Catholic paraphernalia onto the side. But it was a, such a disaster before the Reformation. Pope Alexander VI had, I think, 10 or so illegitimate children by a whole variety of mistresses. And I'm thinking, now, how did this occur with it being the pope? This just seems off. And, um, and he acknowledged them. It wasn't even like he was pretending they weren't his kids. He had like all of these illegitimate children by different mistresses. And side note, they were all married to other men. It wasn't like a harem situation. It was like the wife of another guy. So it's just serial adultery. And um, he was a Borgia, so Pope Alexander VI was, was one of the Borgia family, and uh, many stories have been told about the debauchery of the Borgias, and they were sort of known for, like, incest and poisoning people. So it was, it was not great. And Lucretia Borgia was his daughter, and she has been... She, she has been featured in many stories as the kind of femme fatale who, yeah, she was supposed to have had a hollow ring that she, you know, was dumping arsenic in people's drinks all the time. M much of this is probably exaggerated. However, the, um, the power grab that the Borgias were up to, that's not exaggerated. So she was married to numerous different guys in political alliances and, and this kind of thing. Um, there are some really horrific um, orgies that were thrown in the papal palace with uh, Pope Alexander there and his daughter Lucretia supposedly there and um, anyway really just truly abominable stuff going on in you know the Pope's home uh, so he was a great uh, you know one of the great shining examples of why Martin Luther needed to happen um, so uh, Lucretia is his daughter and she uh, married a guy once she had a string of husbands but one of um, the men she married she then began um, an affair about a year later uh, with so she's the sister-in-law now of the guy that she's sleeping with and his name was Francesco Gonzaga the Marquis of Mantua so she's having an affair with this guy. She's married to a different one. It's all very complicated and bad. Um, so uh, he, though, is married to a woman named Isabel Desta. And she was an incredibly powerful woman. And she is an, an example of the, the powerful woman who accomplishes a huge amount by means of her sort of social status. So Isabel Desta was, um, her husband's going around being a pain, no doubt. And she was really handling a lot on the home front. She's ruling the city. He got like taken as a hostage in Venice for three years or something. And she and she was probably saying good riddance. But anyway, uh, she's ruling the city while he's gone. She has to withstand an attack. She takes over the military. She has to um, take over the, like study industry and study agriculture. And meanwhile, she's commissioning paintings from Da Vinci and from Michelangelo and from Raphael and Titian. And she's got all the most famous poets and the most famous philosophers and artists in her circle. And then she's, you know, politicking and she's getting her 15 year old son made a bishop. This is the other thing is because of the, the situation with trying to get power all the time, you have so many teenage bishops. And just think of how hideous that would be. So like picture in your mind's eye a 15 year old boy and then give him a bishopric. Like nothing will go wrong here. And so she got him made a bishop when he was 15 and then she was trying to get him up to cardinal, right? So that would have been a real coup if she could have gotten him a cardinal, cardinalship? I don't know what you call that. Anyway, uh, when he was maybe 17 is when she was agitating for that. But again, she was an incredibly ambitious woman and not 
admirable per se. So she's trying to get her son uh, made a cardinal. And just as a side note, um, there were a number of, there was a lot of the teenage uh, cardinals, teenage bishops thing going on because it was not about God <laughs> at all. It was about the money. It was about the power. And um, so I yeah, refer back to what Rachel said about just the, the huge amount of tyranny that was going on. So you've got these, these young, obviously not qualified bishops. And one especially horrific thing was Pope Leo X, I believe it was Leo X, who was openly homosexual. So this is in the later part of the 16th century. So still the height of the Reformation. He's openly homosexual. As soon as he gets made pope, he uh, makes his little boyfriend, teenage boyfriend, a cardinal. And so now they're literally sleeping together, the pope and the cardinal, and they're just sharing the same bed and everybody knew it. So it's like this is a really, truly dark, dark time in the church. And so when people act like, well, see, was the Reformation really all that necessary? I just feel like splitting the church, that's such a drastic measure. No, it was really dark and really bad. Um, so Isabel d'Esta, right, she's got her, her husband being troublesome, sleeping with the Borgia girl, uh, and no doubt many others. I think he died of, or no, he might have been killed in war, but he, did, he contracted syphilis from prostitutes, and he didn't sound like a guy you wanted to be married to. Um, anyway, uh, she takes this young 12-year-old, who is her husband's cousin, to Rome with her. She's going to travel to Rome, and this little 12-year-old girl is named Julia Gonzaga. And it's really interesting to me that they are, they treat these 12-year-olds like adults in that they take them to all the, you know, the parties. They are, they go and talk to the Pope. They go and talk to the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and then they marry them off to old busters who are like 42 years old, which is really <laughs> sad. But Julia was already famous for her uh, beauty, and by the time she was 12 years old, and she goes to Rome with her her cousin's wife, Isabel d'Esta, and she's introduced into the, all of the highest circles, and she basically becomes quite the sensation. And she, at, tw at 12, then she's married off to this guy who was 42, who already had, or he might have been 40, anyway, much older. He had a daughter her age, and she suddenly is the ruler of a huge amount of uh, territory and cities and everything. She's 12 or 13 maybe by the time she got married. And then he then goes off and he's like attacking the papal palace. And I don't know why. Anyhow, then he got excommunicated and then the Pope forgave him and then he died. So she's a, <laughs> she's a widow by the time she's 15. And she's in charge of this huge uh, amount of territory and then promptly is attacked by some army who sees this as a great moment to try and take over. I don't know if, I can't remember who it was. Um, and so she's withstanding an attack and she's a widow and she's 15 years old. And she, these, these girls in, from this social sphere, they were given incredible educations and they were the same as the men's educations. And the more I looked into this, the more I feel like the feminists have really pulled a fast one on the stories that they tell about women not having an education. The women were incredibly educated. And so she, by the time she was 12, she was fluent in Greek and Latin and poetry. She was taught poetry and history and literature and everything else. Now, Granted, swordsmanship, probably not. You know, like the girls had other things that they focused on. But as far as the actual, the, the education of the humanist scholar, the women were given it. And it was just, it's just obvious. If you read anything about them, they were highly educated, highly accomplished women. And they had to be because, you know, you're going to be in charge of all this stuff if your husband is being held hostage in Venice or something. Um, so anyhow, she um, is famous for her beauty already by the time she's 12, internationally famous, incidentally, because everybody's like writing letters. Of, they, I think they were all very given to overstatement in that century because everyone seems to have been famous for their beauty. But anyway, and plus you see, you know, like paintings of her. She was painted by Titian, and that painting I believe is lost, but the other paintings, she just doesn't seem like all that, but she was apparently. 
Um, so she is um, defending the castle and all this kind of thing when she's, and I can't even imagine a 15 year old girl trying to handle this sort of thing. And then oddly enough, uh, her fame had spread so far that the Sultan in Constantinople had heard of her or at least his grand vizier had. And he sent a pirate who was this notorious Barbarossa to go and kidnap her and bring her to the harem. So she's like this woman who is friends with all the like artists of the Renaissance and then her castle gets attacked. She was, I think she might have been about 20 at this time. Her castle is attacked in the night by this Muslim pirate who is trying to haul her off. And I think there may have been a little bit of a um, power grab in the harem or something. Like I think he, there might have been other things going on uh, back home. I don't know why he wanted to take her back to the Sultan. But just, um, I, I found this quote, the Sultan this is how he prefaced his letters. I, who am the sultan of sultans, the sovereign of sovereigns, the distributor of crowns to the monarchs of the surface of the globe, I, the shadow of God on earth, the sultan of Padisha of the White Sea, the Black Sea, Rumelia, Anatolia, Karamania, Rum, Salkar, Salkadar, Diakbar, Kurdistan, Azerbaijan, Persia, Damascus, Aleppo, Cairo, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, all Arabia, Yemen, and other countries which my noble ancestors conquered and which my august majesty has likewise conquered with my flaming sword. I, Sultan Suleiman Khan, son of Sultan Selim Khan, son of Sultan Bayezid, you who are Francis, King of France. That's like, dear Francis. Um, <laughs> anyway, this is the Sultan that sends, like this pirate comes and he was this notorious pirate with whole fleets of ships. Anyway, castle gets attacked in the night they're already in the, ca uh, the, the pirates are in the castle before she's woken up by a servant and she escapes and, and it's this dramatic thing. She makes it to this other palace and then this um, boy who was actually closer to her own age who was kind of in love with her and they had this sort of tragic romance because he was made a cardinal when he was 17. So now he's celibate. Anyway, he's, um, <laughs> he's suddenly... Uh, like he hears about it and he rallies an army and he goes after the pirate. I mean, it's just this incredible life that she was leading and, and it was a very dangerous time, right? It's this funny combination of wealth and opulence, but also a huge amount of danger. And she, she made it out. And then there's this funny, there's this story that she had her, the servant who helped her get away, that she had him killed because he had seen her because she wasn't fully clothed when she had to make her escape. And then there's other people that are like, that is so ridiculous. That never happened. That's such a ridiculous myth. So anyway, there's some sort of question about that. Um, it doesn't seem in keeping with her character to have had the guy that rescued her stabbed. But um, it was an odd time. So I don't know. Um, but anyway, so she's got this cardinal who's in love with her. And then he gets poisoned by someone. And it's just this incredibly um, high stakes poker that they are all playing all the time, you know? And she had um, all of this influence over the poets. Everything was dedicated to her. Like all the poetry was dedicated to her. Um, everybody's gushing about her amazing beauty and her intelligence and so forth. Like I said, they gushed about a lot of people, but still, she seemed way up there. And she seems to have been heartbroken when the cardinal was poisoned. Her husband, she seemed fond of him, but I don't think she probably knew him very well. She was 12. He was gone by the time she was 15, and she didn't seem too broken up about that. But um, this cardinal, who was closer to her age, and then his uncle, the pope, made him cardinal as he was dying to sort of consolidate the family interests. And um, so, so it was this kind of oddly tragic life and then she sort of retired into a convent she didn't take orders but she just lived in the convent for a while and she studied and she was devoting herself to uh, more spiritual things because she had been kind of the sort of the essence of the glitterati if you will um, so in um, he her the cardinal dies um, at 24 he's 24 years old when he's poisoned and the next year um, is kind of this interesting year in northern Italy. So if you think about 1535, this is after Luther, right? He's nailed his 95 theses. It's had time to sort of percolate out. And there's a lot of talk about the Reformation in other parts of Europe. But of course, Italy is the belly of the beast, if you will. So um, it, well, it was heavily... Um, frowned upon in Italy, but in 1536, um, a guy named Bernardo Ochino shows up, 
in northern Italy. And because Julia Gonzaga was such a, a person, you know, she was just surrounded by the elite, um, he shows up and he's really making waves with his sermons. It was Lent, and he was, he was brought in to preach the Lenten sermons. And it was, um, he wasn't talking about sola fide or anything. He just was this kind of famous preacher, and everybody loved to hear him. And several years before, the Holy Roman Emperor had, had been there listening to his Advent sermons, and everyone was just overwhelmed at this guy's preaching. And so Okino shows up on, on the stage, and she becomes good friends with Okino, because of course she did, because she was really at the heart of all of what was most exciting in society. And there was another guy named Juan Valdez, who wasn't that the coffee guy like back in the 80s? It's not that guy. Um, Juan de Valdez. And he was a humanist, but he had an interest in biblical interpretation. And part of the, the Renaissance thing, you know, is this recovery of the original languages and going back and reading the philosophers in the original Greek and realizing how much they had missed out on. And just this recovery, going back to the, to the source, right? That was the whole impetus for the Renaissance. And so the Reformation was clearly just one more example of doing that. You're doing it with the scriptures, not just with the philosophers, but with the, um, yeah, but with, with the scriptures. And so Juan Valdez is uh, translating the Bible from Hebrew into Spanish. And suddenly they're reading the Psalms in Spanish, and they're reading the Book of Romans in Spanish. And Michelangelo loved to hear Valdez's Book of Romans. He wanted it read aloud. And he was part of this other woman's circle, and they just wanted to hear it. And, th and this is, goes back to what Rachel was saying. That would be novel. And so Valdez has written, he, he dedicates them all to Julia, too. Like, he translates them, and everybody's reading them, and Michelangelo's reading them, but they're dedicated to Julia because she was uh, a good friend and was so um, involved in the whole thing. And so he's writing her letters saying, I assume that you have been poring over the book of Psalms that I sent you in Spanish. And it's like, if you'd never read the book of Psalms, I mean, of course you would. You know, this was like such a privilege and so novel. And many of the other women were studying Hebrew so that they could read it in the original because they were humanist scholars as well. And I should just clarify, humanist at the time of the Renaissance doesn't mean like secular humanist. It just means studying the humanities, right? The, a scholar of the humanities. And so these women were highly educated and interested in the conversation. And so this, this year, 1536, Okino, this sort of really fiery preacher shows up. Juan Valdez is there translating the scriptures into Spanish. Julia Gonzaga is there and they have this weekly meeting with a number of other people. But they were kind of the movers and the shakers. And Julia um, Gonzaga and Juan Valdez, their discussions about the scriptures get put into a, a dialogue that's published called The Christian Alphabet that Juan Valdez um, puts together. And it is, it's just the two of them talking, so Julia and him. And this is the first printed in Italian um, exposition of the doctrine of sola fide. So it's the first thing that comes out in Julia and he are talking about it and Okino is in the circle and they're just talking about things but pretty soon it's sola fide that comes out and they're realizing wait what Luther has been talking about that's that's the answer to all this corruption to all the stuff that's going on and so it, it's about five years I think is the real golden age here where where there's all this impetus, but it's really in the, in the thick of the most influential people. And like I said, the artists, the poets, everybody's dedicating things to her. And she's really kind of what pulls the circle together. And so I think it's interesting that like before the Reformation, the monks are doing important stuff, but you add the women into the mix and something very different happens. Right? And so she kind of makes, she's sort of the thing that, the catalyst that produces this new, she's not the one who, who writes a treatise on sola fide, but she is the catalyst and it was her social scene that was the catalyst for sola fide getting um, spelled out in Italy. And then in, in 1542, the Inquisition is established in Rome. So the Spanish Inquisition comes and, and everybody realizes it's, time to go, like this, this isn't gonna work. And so um, Peter Martyr Vermigli is one of the reformers and he has to flee, Okino has to flee, Juan Valdez is dead now. And so they take what they had done with Julia in her circles and they go to the continent. So they go to Heidelberg, they go to Oxford and all of the movement there really comes out of 
what they had there in northern Italy with her. And then she devotes herself to helping the refugees, helping people flee. She's obviously wealthy. She's facilitating this. There were other women who didn't. They, they suddenly backed off as soon as, as soon as it was no longer just kind of this edgy thing and, oh dear, now it looks like there's actual problems, then they quickly backed off, but she didn't, and she devoted herself to helping the, um, helping the cause and helping people get out. And the thing that I love about the stories, and the more I was reading about it, the thing that I really love is that it's a different side of hospitality. And I think that we might have a very truncated idea of what hospitality actually looks like or how effective it could be. And I know that there's, yeah, picking up the strays, making sure people have a place to go on Thanksgiving, feeding the widows and orphans, that's, that's hugely important. And so it's not to set that aside. And that also was part of what these women did. They opened their homes to refugees. Um, Isabel d'Asta, when Rome was sacked, she had 2,000 refugees in her home, which tells you what her home was like. Um, but anyway, they, they were doing that too. But there's also this incredibly powerful side to it, which is showing hospitality in a very strategic way. It's like, let me use what I've got, let me use my education, and I'm going to facilitate something. And I'm going to do it by means of something that's actually quite domestic, right? I mean, it's throwing parties. And the thing I love about it is it's not throwing parties for the sake of having a lot of likes on Pinterest, right? It was something far, far more important that they were after. And these women who they knew the cause and then they used what they had to make it go. And the other thing that I loved about it is that it was a lot of single women. It was just um, many of them were widowed. Uh, like Julie was widowed by 15. She never remarried. A number of the other ones were widowed, but they were in a very unique place to be able to facilitate this. And so I think we tend to think, well, if you don't have a family, there's no real point, right? Oh, well, you know, you cook for your kids, but I don't have kids, so. But these were women who were absolutely making the most of their time and the fact that they had the resources and they had the ability. And, and I just think, especially for women who are past the phase of life where they aren't yet in the phase of life, where they have a brood of little kids at home that are taking up all their time, there are so many opportunities. And I realize you can't invite Michelangelo to your parties. He won't come. But everybody is surrounded by something that they could make use of like this. And she was obviously Julia Gonzaga and Isabel d'Esta. They're, they're at the top of society, but Martha was not, right? She's doing this with Christ and with the apostles, which looked like nothing much, right? It didn't really look like the newest, most exciting philosophers in town. On the other hand, it kind of did, right? Like they saw with the eye of faith. And so they were using what they, what they had to facilitate these things. Or you think about the women, like I mentioned earlier, opening their homes for the churches and the women of the Renaissance who were just putting people together and then facilitating that and, and watching what can be done with it. And I think it's such a powerful tool that it, hospitality is more than just like, you're a person, I'll feed you some food. Although that, that's important, right? That's an important part of it. But this is these women had a goal in mind, and they were being incredibly strategic with what they were given. And I think if you look at the influence that Gonzaga had um, throughout the rest of Europe, you'll see that these men that were in her circle and that and and they were they were able to do their thinking almost in this kind of protected place off to the side, right? And they they could really hash out the the details of Sola Fide, and then they took the show on the road, and they took it to Oxford, and they took it to Heidelberg, and, and they went elsewhere, and some of them were martyred, and some of them were burned by the Inquisition, but, um, but she had this amazing, and it actually, I should add that she didn't, she died before the Inquisition got to her, but, but she was uh, definitely on the list, and so uh, it seemed to be a real mercy that she died before, before that happened, but she used all of the the wealth and the you know the connections that she had and she really turned a profit on it and i think much of what happened in the other places in europe if you if you were to go back you would see that it it really came out of her circles and so i would just encourage everybody to think bigger when it comes to hospitality and not just think i love throwing themed birthday parties 
you know, as fun as that can be, you know, I just think there are so many other opportunities and we could think much bigger than that. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was Rebecca Merkel's talk, Reformation Salonniere. For more from Becca, you can listen to her podcast, What Have You, with her sister Rachel, or you can get her book, Even Exile, today at canonpress.com.